Please uh, take your Bible and go to Mark chapter 2. That's where we're going to start this morning. We're in a series called Overcome Like Jesus. And partly this is to prepare us for Easter when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We thought it would be good to spend some time in the Gospels looking at the life of Christ and what he did in preparation for that. And uh, I, hope, I hope you all can come on Easter Sunday. It's April, what is it, 9th? I wrote it in my notes somewhere. It changes every year. It's just incredible. Whoever decided that, I don't know. Um, but it does. It changes every year. So April 9th, uh, please, please come. And it's a great time to bring friends, a great time to uh, invite neighbors and coworkers and that sort of thing. But... Uh, Anyhow, we're in this series on overcoming like Jesus, and and what we thought was it's really good to know what Jesus taught and to understand, like, his instruction for disciples, but it's also really good to to see him in action, if that makes sense. So I, I think both are really important for us, at least those of us who consider ourselves disciples of Christ. If you think of yourself as a disciple of Christ... You want to be doing what he said, right? But then also, you don't want to just do what he said in sort of like a cold, mechanical, legalistic way. You want to have his style, the sort of like manner in which Jesus did things, which can't really be written down with like a list of principles, right? You have to see him in action and you're like, oh, okay, that's how you're doing it. So uh, I think that's kind of more our approach right now, is to look at him in action, look at his example, and to ask the question, how did Jesus deal with difficulties in life? So we've already looked at a number of these in previous weeks, and uh, today we're looking at the subject of criticism. How did Jesus deal with criticism? When somebody said to Jesus, you're doing it wrong, what did Jesus do? Like, how, how did he respond to that? And uh, so that's what we're looking at today. I'm, I want to look at four examples, so that's why I have like a big green one here. Uh, so that's Mark chapter 2 is where we're going to start. It says in verse 23 there, One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. So that's the question. That's the criticism. Did you catch it? You're, what are you doing? You're, you're breaking the rules. What were they doing? They were plucking heads of grain. So that you, you can imagine the scene. You're walking through a, a, a byway, a path that is alongside a field, and they're just reaching out their hand as they're going. They're plucking some grains, and rubbing them in their hands, and eating them as they go. And this was probably not their field. It was somebody else's field. Uh, we know the disciples were from, um, you know, mo- many of them at least were fishermen. So fishermen don't usually have fields too, right? They have uh, boats. And, but there's interesting, there's a, there's a law in Deuteronomy 23, 25 that says, if you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may... Pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. Isn't that interesting? There's actually a law that said you could just sort of like have a snack, but if you came in with the sickle and you started like bundling it, yeah, I mean, that's that's stealing. You're you're stealing your neighbor's crops. Um, So that's interesting. So it wasn't illegal what they were doing, but the issue was taking it on the Sabbath doing it on a Saturday where, when Jews are not allowed to work. And so the Pharisees believed that you should prepare for the Sabbath. In fact, their word for Friday was called the day of preparation. Did you know that? That's how they call Friday. And why is it called the day of preparation? Because on Saturday you're not supposed to work. But you still want to eat on Saturday. You still want to enjoy life on Saturday. And so you prepare on Friday, you want to make all your food, get it all ready, uh, collect all your wood for your fire, so you, you can still have a fire, but like you don't want to be out collecting wood, right? Does that make sense? And these disciples, it's Saturday, 
and they find themselves in the unfortunate situation where they're hungry and they have not prepared. Because if they were prepared, they would just, you know, have some food in, the, in, the, in their pocket or, you know, like they wouldn't need to be just grabbing somebody else's grain as they walk along. And so, but I'm not convinced that they're really breaking the Sabbath. I, I don't know. I go back and forth on it. Um, were they really breaking the Sabbath? Does it really count as work? Uh, I, I, I'm not really sure about it. Um, seems like they were just casually grabbing like a snack while they're walking. To me, that doesn't seem like work. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're, you could maybe get them on a technicality. Because you could say, well, what is the definition of reaping? The definition of reaping. Okay, it's, uh, it's harvesting grain from a field. So they, they were doing that by hand, which is not a very effective way to do it. But it's not like they were bundling it and bringing it home and then like grinding it up, making flour, making a fire, making bread. You know, they're just sort of like, they're just sort of eating as they go. Anyhow, look at how Jesus responds. Verse 25, and he said to them, have you never read what David said, what David did when he was in need and was hungry and he and those who were with him how he entered the house of God in the, in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he also gave to those who were with him. So Jesus points them to an Old Testament precedent. Isn't that interesting that Jesus read the Bible? Jesus knew the Bible? Jesus quoted the Bible? 2,000 years ago, like people were already doing this. Like what I'm doing right now, what we're, you know, it's really fascinating. He's like, don't you remember the time with David? So he points to an incident in 1 Samuel when David was, he was in trouble with Saul, the king, and he went to Jonathan, who was like his best friend forever, and said to his BFF, can you find out if your dad wants to kill me? Reasonable request, right? And so uh, there's this whole elaborate strategy to it. I don't want to get into all the details. But essentially, Jonathan finds out, yes, for sure, dad wants to kill you. He's also the king, which means he's in charge of the army, so you better run. And so David grabs his like, posse, his like, closest friends, and uh, he goes on the lamb. You know? He goes on the run from the government. He is not prepared. He does not have food. He doesn't even have a sword. He just, he just takes off. And he comes across this uh, priest, and there's this special bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. But because David was in need, and his men, and they were hungry, the priest said, all right, well, you can have some. So it's it an example of somebody breaking the rules because somebody was in need and they were hungry, just like the disciples of Christ were in need, and, in, and they were, the opposite of being in need is being prepared. They weren't prepared. They did not have their kind bar stashed in the toga. You know, like, it was just, they were just found unprepared on the Sabbath. Just like David and his men were found unprepared. I think this is really interesting. The question, question really does come down to the Sabbath. What does the Sabbath stand for? Let's look at verse 27. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. God's laws weren't designed to make us miserable. They weren't designed to make them miserable either. They weren't made for the Sabbath. It's not like God invented this idea of a Sabbath, which is taking a day of rest on Saturday, and for them at least. And he didn't design that and say, you know what? This will really mess with them. There, there are going to be times where they're going to really want to do things on Saturday, and they won't be able to, but they will submit to my Sabbath because the Sabbath is supreme. That's not how it's set up. It's like, look, these people work too much. Let's give them a day off. That's the heart of the Sabbath. It was made for people. People weren't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for people. Do you know what a slave can't do in Egypt? Take a day off. So they get out of Egypt and God gives them a gift of the Sabbath. and says, look, you're all going to take, and he says, even your animals. Give your animals a day off too. 
I love that part. <laughs> and so God's laws weren't designed to make us miserable. It was to liberate us from working seven days a week. These guys aren't farming or harvesting, they're, but they're, they are in a gray area. I'll, I'll admit it. They're in a gray area. I mean, you could get them on a technicality, I guess. Um, now, let's think about the question of how did Jesus handle criticism? Okay, because this is my first example, my first incident. How did Jesus handle criticism? So they criticized, really, the disciples of Christ for, for eating on the Sabbath, or, you know, harvesting on the Sabbath. How did Jesus handle that criticism? Well, here's what he didn't do. He didn't run away. He didn't run away. He didn't lose control and start shouting at them. He didn't deflect. And, and you know, like he, he engaged with them when they criticized him. I thought this was really interesting. Jesus engaged with people when they criticized, with him, criticized him. I wonder what you do when people criticize you about your faith. And here's the thing also that Jesus did is that he responded to their question with a question. That is brilliant. Because a question makes you think. If you just say, well, you're an idiot, you don't know anything. I mean, he could have said that, right? Like, he's smarter than they are. He knows the Bible better than they do. He's better at righteousness than the Pharisees. He could just be like, you guys are just amateurs, you know? Like, I'm Mozart, and you're just like a kid learning to play. It would have been true. He doesn't do any of that. He asks them a question in return. His question is, uh, do, do you remember? Their, their question is, why are, they, why are they eating on the Sabbath or why are they plucking grain on the Sabbath? His response is, well, haven't you read about David and what he did with his men? And, and they weren't allowed to have that bread and, and he gave it to them when they were in need and they were hungry. So he asked them a question in response to get them to think. Uh, I think that's really helpful. It's an extremely effective strategy. If somebody says to you, why are you so mean to gay people by condemning their beliefs and you know, their right to have their own standards for marriage? I mean, you can answer that a lot of different ways. Some of you maybe have different positions on it. But you could also answer it this way. You could say, why are you so mean to Christians by condemning their beliefs and their rights to have their own standards for marriage? Yeah, you can answer a question that's criticizing you with a question to show that, you know, they're, this very thing they're doing is the thing that they're condemning in you, right? They're condemning you based on your beliefs. Uh, and I think it can be a very effective way to do things. All right, let's look at another example. Number two, Matthew chapter 12, verse 9. The value of a question is it makes a person think. We can learn a lot from watching Jesus. We can learn a lot from his words, but also what he does, his actions. Matthew chapter 12, verse 9, is another one of these Sabbath incidents where there's a disagreement between how Jesus does things and how the Pharisees do things. Matthew chapter 12, verse 9 says, He went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? They're goading him. Do you see this? This is a setup. This is totally a setup. Just imagine it. You're all in, you're, you're, we're, all in the, we're all in this synagogue. We're all sitting around. They know Jesus is questionable on the Sabbath. They know that he does, he does not follow the tradition of the elders, as we'll see in, in, a, in our next incident. He does not follow the tradition of the elders. The question is, can we get him to do something that's clearly a violation of the law so that we can nail him, so that we can report him, so that we can ostracize him? So this, is, this whole scene is a setup. Look at it again. It says, uh, verse 10, a man was there with a withered hand and they asked him, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? You see how this is a setup? It's not like Jesus asked them, you know, do you guys mind if I heal this guy? No, they're like, so uh, yeah, you see the guy with the disability here? You're a healer. Is it lawful to heal on this? It's, it's totally a setup. 
And you know what? It made Jesus angry. This is one of the very few times you see Jesus get angry. In Mark, uh, we're not going to flip there, but in Mark 3, 5, it says, and he looked around at them with anger. You know, it's okay to be angry. Anger's not a sin. In fact, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. You know, God gets angry. Christ got angry. You know, you get angry from time to time. The question is, what do you do with the anger? You know, now if Jesus uh, took a chair and just started hitting people with it like he's a professional wrestler in the middle of the synagogue, that would be sinful, right? But he looked around with them in anger, and then he responded to them. And you know what he did? He asked them a question. Look at verse 11. It says, he said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He engages directly. Jesus is criticized. Jesus engages. I found this pretty rebuking. I, I think a lot of times our, our instinct is to say, you know what, I'm not going to engage. I don't want to feed into it. Right? When people criticize you. And I, I think there's a time for that. You know, there's a time. There's wisdom. But what I'm seeing with Jesus is that he didn't really back down. And he didn't lose control either. He engaged, and he gauged using questions. The man is like a sheep in a pit. It wouldn't be right to just leave him there. So let's just, let's just imagine the scenario. You're walking along. You're walking along, and suddenly you hear, bah, bah, you know, like, I can't really do sheep sound, sounds too well, but I imagine that if you're around sheep a lot, there's like a certain bah that means like I'm in distress. You know, like with a dog, we understand this, right? When a dog's in distress, the bark is different than normal. Uh, so like you're going along, you hear this bleeding of the sheep, and you're like, oh, look at that. Molly the sheep fell in a hole. Shoot, it's Saturday. <laughs> I can see you're in a lot of distress down there. And, uh, you know, my heart goes out to you. I'd really, like to, I'd really like to help you get out of this hole. But, you know, i got to honor God and His commandments. So, you know, I'm going to go get you a snack. And I'll be back in 24 hours. Jesus is saying to them, like, who would ever do that? If you saw a sheep in a pit, what do you do? You go down there and you say, oh, you poor thing, and you, you work on the Sabbath. That's what you do. Everybody does that. And that's normal, and that's okay, and that's godly, and that's righteous. Because God doesn't want a, a, even a sheep to be stuck in a hole on, on, the, on the Sabbath day. So that's, Jesus, that's his whole point in response to them. And there's really two codes here. There's the, the letter of the law. There's the actual writings of what the Scripture says that they're, that they're dealing with. It's called Torah, if you've ever heard of that word before. That's the law code that God gave to the, to the people of Israel. So that's the letter of the law. But then there's the intention of what God wants them to, to be and do with all these laws. You know what I mean? There's really like, there's the surface level and then there's the deeper truths. You know, like why does God want it so that, um, you know, you can, you can rescue a sheep on the Sabbath? So Because God cares about stupid animals. You know what I mean? Or why, uh, why, why does God, there's a law that says you have to build a little wall around the roof of your house. They had flat roofs because it didn't snow and you could hang out on your roof. So why, why have a little fence around, or a little, like, partial wall? So people don't fall off the roof, okay? Because we care about people, even when they're dumb, even when they're maybe intoxicated, or it's dark and they don't see, or they're a, a visitor and they don't know where the ledge is exactly. You know, like, whatever. Like, just going to put walls around all the houses just so that this doesn't happen. Right? So there's the law, then there's the actual character of God that's driving it. Why, why does God want to have this law or that law? Because he cares about people. He wants people to have 
shalom, this idea of peace and completeness and harmony in a society. This is the concept of loving people. And Jesus always prioritizes this over the specific uh, commandment, the need of the person over these other things. Jesus said, loving God and loving people is more important than anything. And the question is, when is it appropriate to make an exception? That's the question. Uh, and, we're, and, and it just, it just kind of shows such a contrast. I mean, here you have these Pharisees. They've got this man with this, this disabled hand, okay? And they're using him like a pawn in a chess game. He's nothing to them. He's just, he's a means to expose this, this upstart rabbi for being a fraud. That's all he is to them. And here's Jesus, and he's angry because now there's all this pressure. Now there's all this like intensity. He can't just heal the guy. Now it's, it's a big thing. But yet he still sees the guy, and he sees him as a real person. And he cares about the guy's need. Just like you would care if you came across a distressed animal in a pit, and you said, I could just lift that animal out of there. Verse 13, then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. What boldness Jesus has in this situation. What boldness. Here is a man of courage. Here is somebody that knows if I engage with this man with this disability, I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble. These people are going to go out and they're going to accuse me of breaking the Sabbath. And, you know, that could ruin my ministry. You know, like these guys, these are power brokers. These are influencers. They're all going to, you know, they don't have social media, but they're all going to use their channels of getting messages out that this Jesus of Nazareth is no good. Don't listen to him. They're going to try to cancel Jesus. And in fact, Jesus still acts. He still does the thing for the guy. He had his priorities straight. He had God first, then he had people second, and then he had himself third. If you put yourself first, you'd be like, ah, you know what? I'm going to make a note that there's a guy with a, with a, with a hand problem in this particular synagogue. I'm going to come back tomorrow. I'm going to, I'm going to heal him tomorrow. You know, if he wanted to be smooth, if he wanted to handle the situation, that's what he would have done. But he didn't. He said, you know what? I'm going to do the right thing even though it's going to get me in hot water, even though it's going to get me in trouble because it's what God would have me to do. He never lost sight of the human need in front of him. Let's look at another example, chapter 7. He never dehumanized people. You don't want to dehumanize people. You don't want to look at somebody and say, oh, they're just one of those. Right? Or like uh, those of you who play video games, an NPC, a non-player character. Those are also called bots. You know, they're, they're not real people. They're, you know, they're, they're just crunchies. That's not, that's not how we look at people. Not in real life. All right, number three, Mark chapter 7. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled. Man, that is unwashed. For the Pharisees, verse 3, and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels. My favorite one, dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Okay, another criticism. Another criticism, right? You're doing it wrong, Jesus. Your disciples are doing it wrong. They're not, they're not washing their hands before they eat. Now, just to be clear, germ theory is from the 1800s. There's no way these guys are thinking, I need to eliminate the germs on my hands before I eat. It's just, it's just not in their world yet, okay? So that's not what's going on here. This is a tradition. This is ritual purification. It's less about 
uh, physically cleaning than it is about uh, going through a ritual for the sake of the ritual, if that makes any sense. Now, there were cleansing rituals God had in the law. Uh, if you touch a dead body or if you emitted a bodily fluid, things like that, there was a ritual, right? Now, the Pharisees, what they did is they like, they said, you know what, we need more of these. Let's, let's have another ritual. Every time before we eat, let's just ritually pour water on our hands. Somebody somewhere said, that's a good idea. And so everybody did it. Now, if you go back and read the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, it's not in there. It's not a law from God. It's a tradition of the elders. And so they're asking Jesus, who do you, you, know, who do you think you are? Who do your disciples think they are? You're not following the tradition. And now here Jesus doesn't ask him a question. Verse 6, he turns the tables on him. He says in verse 6, and he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? Whoa, Jesus. I mean, I thought you are supposed to be nice. I thought you were supposed to be friendly and, you know, win friends and influence people. What are you doing? Whip out the H word. That's like an H bomb right there. You hypocrites. <laughs> Hello. Let's look at it. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. You see, the Pharisees had good intentions. They really did. The Pharisees were people that said, I just want to obey God so much. I want to follow all the rules and, and, and let's make up new rules that make it so it's hard for us to break his actual rules. That's the heart of the Pharisee. The Pharisee is not like, oh, I just want to really be a hypocrite when I grow up. You know, like that, nobody says that. The, the Pharisee is, it has a heart of zeal and, and desire for God and to, to, to obey God and to take the, the Bible seriously. That's the Pharisee. But they got it wrong. They, got, they went into legalism and they went into adding all this extra stuff. And then what follows after legalism is a heart that says, you know, you're doing it wrong. You know, you're doing it wrong, too. You know, you're doing it wrong, too. Criticizing everyone else. How many times do you see the Pharisees criticize Jesus? I mean, this is our third one just, just in this little collection here. But as it turns out, I had to pick. I had a bunch. I had a whole list and I'm like, all right, let's, I'm just going to pick four, okay? I'm just going to pick four because it's a Sunday. They changed the time. I don't know who decided that tradition of the elders, but it's stupid too. And now we're all tired, and so we're just going to stick with four. Over and over, Jesus shows that God gave the law and the Sabbath as a blessing to the people. Jesus, Jesus is, is showing them that it's not supposed to be a burden, God does not want you to be miserable. That's not his goal in life. What father, what good father would ever want that for his children? A good father wants the children to be taken care of. How much more God, our heavenly father. The law is not supposed to be made into a justification to not take care of people. And that's what, that's what he nails them on. All right, I, I want to make one point before I, I go on. In verse, uh, what is it, Se verse 6, he quotes Isaiah. In verse 7, he says, this is the Isaiah quote, he says, In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, in the Old Testament, all 39 books of the Bible, however many thousands of verse, verses that is, this is the one verse that directly applies to the situation. And Jesus brought it like that. I mean, come on. you got to give them some credit. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. That's exactly what this washing of hands and this tradition. This is, this is teaching as if it's a doctrine. But it's just a man's commandment. It's not God's commandment. It's incredible to see Jesus. I mean, do you think Jesus just like had an immediate download there? 
Or do you think he had to work at it? I think he probably had to read the Bible a lot. You know, it's like the way God works with us is, you know, you, you read, you do the thing, and then he brings it to your remembrance. I mean, I'm not going to limit God. If he wants to download something to you you've never read, you know, he created the universe. He can do it. But, like, my bet is that Jesus was a Bible guy. And that he had read this and that God was working with him in, through the Spirit and that this is, this is the result. Verse 6. Oh, no, we already read that. Verse 9. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. Whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, an invented technical term. That is, given to God. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making the word of God by your tradition void by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. So they have this weird tradition. Did you, did you catch it? Do you understand it? They have this weird tradition that Let's say your parents are in trouble financially. Let's say they need help. They need money. They need food, whatever. They need a place to stay. And, and, and you, according to the law, you're supposed to honor your parents. You're supposed to take care of your parents, okay? Not just when you're a, a child. Even as an adult, you're supposed to honor your parents. You're supposed to take care of your parents, if they're, if, especially if they're in need. And so Jesus is saying, like, okay, you guys, you guys have this rule called Corbin. And uh, the way Corbin works is you just say, well, I'm, I promise to give this money to the church. Well, in their case, it was a temple, but you know what I mean. I promise to give this money to the church, so therefore I don't have to take care of my parents anymore. Like, if I was going to take care of them, I would have used this money, but I already dedicated this to God. So, you know, too bad for you. This is exactly the kind of thing that if you think Christianity is just a list of rules that you're going to fall into. You're going to fall into the Corbin trap, and you're going to think that the whole time you're righteous. The whole time you're going to be like, oh, I am so righteous. I have Corbined my 401k to the Lord. <laughs> Too bad my parents made poor decisions. Right? Like that's, you're going to think you're righteous the whole time. Meanwhile, Jesus is blowing them up. He's saying, hello, you're doing it wrong. We're not doing it wrong. We might have dirty hands, but you're, you're ripping off your parents and using God as an excuse. You're doing it wrong. Let's see how that goes. Sometimes it's best to stand up for yourself when someone criticizes you. Did you hear me? Sometimes it's best to stand up for yourself. Now, I'm not saying go out and be the police, the police of the world. I don't need you going on social media and telling the world that the world is in sin. It's supposed to be in sin. Like, that's just the way the world is. Sinners are going to sin, okay? I'm saying when they criticize you, what are you going to do? And sometimes it is appropriate to answer, a, 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 answer wrath with kindness, okay? And other times it's better to uh, answer a fool according to his folly, and say, well, if that's really true, then this. And other times, it's better to ask a question than to give an answer. Um, and sometimes you just, you just go toe-to-toe, and it's go time. And Jesus did that from time to time. And I, I don't want you to think, oh, well, you know, we're, we're supposed to love people, so that means never make them uncomfortable. What? Any of you ever have kids? Like, most of parenting is making your kids uncomfortable, and that's what love is. A lot of times, I don't know most, but all right. It takes wisdom to know what response it is. All right, let's look at the last one. Luke chapter 5. Here they ask the question about fasting. They ask the question about fasting. So it's not Sabbath. I got off the Sabbath. So if you were nervous about that, it's going to be okay. Luke chapter 5, verse 33. And they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But you're... Yours eat and drink. So once again, they're saying to Jesus, you're doing it wrong. You know, the disciples of John, they, they fast. The disciples of the Pharisees fast. Why don't your fa disciples fast, Jesus? 
What's wrong with you? What's wrong with your disciples? Why don't they fast? Are they just gluttons? They just like to eat all the time? Verse 34, And Jesus said to them, Oh, look, a question. Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the groom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins, and no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. Amen to you wine people out there? Amen. All right. Jesus was doing something new. He didn't fit into their mold. They said, look, John's disciples do it this way. The Pharisees do it this way. What are you doing, Jesus? What, what do you think you're doing? And what he says to them is, I'm doing something new. New wine in new wineskins. Like, Jesus isn't breaking the law. I don't think Jesus sinned. I don't think he broke the law, and I don't think he sinned. And if he did break the law, it was a legal exception, okay? <laughs> that makes sense. Like, what do you do when, you're, when your male child is born, uh, you know, eight days before the Sabbath? And you're supposed to circumcise the child on the eighth day, which is a surgical procedure. And you're supposed to circumcise the child on the Sabbath. You're going to keep the Sabbath, or you're going to keep the law of circumcision? Right? There are times when laws come in conflict and you have to have legal exceptions. Okay, uh, Actually, Jesus talks about that one too, but we're not getting into that today. But at, in addition to following the, the law, okay, Jesus is doing something new as well. He's doing something new. It reminds me of this movie, The Jesus Revolution. Any of you see this one yet? I saw it. It was pretty good. I enjoyed it. Um, in this movie set in the 1970s in California, there's a bunch of hippies. And uh, the hippies, they, they're, they're interested in God, they're interested in peace and love, of course, but also spiritual things. And they start coming to this guy's church, this, this pastor, and uh, the elders do not like it. The elders are like, these people smell, they have messy hair, they don't wear shoes, they're loud, you know, half of them are on drugs, or just like, took a break for Sunday, you know, like, this is, this is not, this is not good. And they came up to uh, the pastor, and they said to him, uh, you, you got to kick these people out of here. You, we can't have these long-haired G Jesus hippies in our church. They're messing up the carpet with their, with their, they don't wear shoes. They have dirty feet, they're messing up the carpet. This is what they say to him. And uh, then they say to him, uh, and, and, don't you forget that we, the elders, are the ones that fund this ministry. So now the pastor has a decision. He's like, okay, well, you know, carpets are expensive. We care about the carpet. Um, but like these, these hippies, you know, they're hurting. They're hurt people seeking God. I can't kick them out. So you know what he did? He set up a station and had them line up and hand-washed every one of their feet so they could still come to church and not mess up the carpet. That's new wine and new wineskins. You know what I mean? Like, that's a great example of new wine. And it's like, all right, well, let's, let's do something. So you have, like, the rules, right? And then you have the example of Jesus. And this is one of those times where it's like, I'm going to follow the example of Jesus. Pretty cool. All right, so let me see if I can summarize a little bit. You can't let people's criticism of you paralyze you. Some of us are so sensitive. To quote, to quote Chris Rock, anybody that says words hurt has never been punched in the face. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Okay, it's not, it's not that words don't hurt. It's just that, like, guys, com compared to the stuff that our forebearers 
our ancestors in the faith have been through. Getting, getting like unfollowed on social media, it's not that bad. You know, or getting canceled or, I mean, what's the worst that happens to us? Do you think they're going to tie one of our legs to a tree and then bring down the thickest branch of the next tree and tie our leg to that tree and then cut the rope so that our body splits in two pieces? Do you think they're going to do that to us? They used to do that to us. That was a thing in the fourth century during the Diocletian persecution where they literally ripped us in half for the people's amusement. We're going to get maybe fired from our job for not going with the flow in some situation, right? Maybe. I mean, it's not that bad. <laughs> it's not that bad. Um, sorry, I got all graphic there. But, I mean, how often do you get to quote Chris Rock and uh, get away with it? Um, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus put it like this in John 6, 60. He said there was, a, there was a situation where he offended some people. He said, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And there were times where Jesus would be talking and people would be like, bro, this is so offensive. What do you mean eat your flesh and drink your blood? That's gross. That's what he had just said in chapter 6 here. That's gross. We can't listen to this. And he turned to his disciples and said, are you going to go too? And Peter said, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Like, look, Jesus, the stakes are too... Like, what, you're, what they're offering, what is the world offering you? What, what are they going to give you? Satisfaction, maybe? Popularity? I don't know. Identity? You're going to have a crew that recognizes you as one of them or something? You know, okay, th those are all... You know, those are not terrible things, right? Those, those are all fine, right? But you put that on the scale, and on the other side, you put eternal life. <laughs> I'm sorry, but like, who else am I going to go to to get eternal life? Is that what they're offering in the world? No. So I, I, I think I'm just going to stick with Jesus. And if they criticize me, I'll, I'll do whatever I can in that moment. But like, I got to just stick with Jesus because like he's offering eternal life. It's just that big. It's that big. It's bigger than the lottery. I mean, think of Steve Jobs. Brilliant guy. Genius. Died of um, liver cancer or pancreatic cancer, right? These people, incredible people, but they all die. Ten out of ten people die. Did you know that? <laughs> Even the smartest ones. I know a couple of them like to get themselves frozen in hopes that when they get thawed out later, it's not like the ice cubes cracking when you put water over them, okay? That's their dream. That's their hope. God bless them. I'm going to put my hope in something a little more realistic, okay? Resurrection. Because I've seen ice cubes crack, and it's not pretty. Jesus said, if the world hates you, John 15, 18, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. You see, there, there are some people that are going to persecute you. And there are other people that are going to keep your word. Some people are going to respond well. Some people are going to respond critically. But you, got, you can't let fear shut you down. That's what I'm saying. You can't let fear shut you down. When you're criticized, don't say, Oh my goodness, I better just shut my mouth and be quiet the rest of my life. Don't do that. Now listen, if somebody criticizes you, you should always listen. Because sometimes they're right. Sometimes we are doing it wrong, or sometimes we're not being true to... But sometimes they're wrong as well. So I think you listen to them, but if it's, if it's criticizing you for something that you're doing right, 
then you, ha then you should engage. Ask them a question back. At the very least, pray for them. Jesus, or, uh, it says in 1 John 3.13, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Shouldn't surprise you if people hate you. You know what should, should, uh, should be your goal, though? Eternal life. <laughs> like it, just makes, it just makes so much sense. So the goal is to be like Jesus. I want to be like that pastor that washed the feet of those smelly hippies. That's how, that's how I want to be. I'm, I'm not looking at to, to change all the, 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 the rules and mess up the carpet, but at the same time, I'm not going to use that as a reason to reject people that are in genuine need. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you would give us courage to stand up for our faith in times when it's difficult, in times when we are criticized or made fun of, we pray that you would help us to follow the example of your son who engaged, who asked questions, who cared enough to spend time with people that were antagonistic towards him. We pray that you give us your wisdom to know how to do that and when to do it. And we ask for your blessing this week. I also uh, pray for our food this, this uh, afternoon, our brunch. Thank you for providing for us, and we ask you to bless that meal as well. And uh, bless our week as well as we go from this place. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.